Hey, speaking upstream need to quickly build interactive web apps a good idea. Hello, data fans. The first time you sprinkle streamnit commands in your Python script, your mind will go, you're a wizard, Harry. You can deploy a Python web app to billions of devices connected to the World Wide Web in an hour without your Python brain touching any line of HTML, CSS, nor JavaScript. So what's the catch? In this video, I'll summarize my two years of breaking Streamly to tell you what I wish I knew I couldn't implement easily. That way, you won't get disappointed halfway through learning it by some of its self-imposed limitations. And you know what? I will even offer some Streamly alternatives in each case for you to test. And my first big problem with Streamlit is... A year ago, I was watching the Adobe Max Live conference. It's one of the biggest events bringing together over 10,000 creative professionals around the Adobe ecosystem. Quite a big mainstream event. Now, if you've used Streamlit for more than five minutes, here are some recordings of the Adobe Max sneak peek talks. And again, we generate a new image matching my pose. And yes, this yellow dress is really adorable. And uh, choose some languages. Let's just do Spanish and German. This is exactly what you use Streamlit for, in front of large audiences like the European Parliament and maybe the CTO of your dream company. But, but could you tell those are Adobe Streamlit projects? There's no Adobe branding, no logo, no fiery red color to make them look distinct. They just look like any other of the million apps deployed over Streamit Cloud. And it's not like it's impossible to customize your app a little. Here's a Streamit app that doesn't really look like a Streamit app. It does take some unofficial hacks I'm about to share with you, and unfortunately a tiny bit of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You can change the primary secondary color theme of the app through the theme menu in the top right toolbar. Feel free to persist these changes in the .streamnit slash config toml file. But this will change the color of every streamnit widget. That's a bit of a shame if you want your buy me a coffee button to stay yellow amongst all of the red buttons. Now, unlike Gradure or Solara, there's no official way to use a background color or border color or any CSS property as an argument of a particular Streamit widget. If you wish to pass uncommon CSS styles like Dot Shadow, you'll need a Streamit widget that renders as HTML and can contain your malicious CSS that will infect your button. <laughs> You can pass CSS code that hijacks specific widgets with a given CSS class through Markdown with the unsafe allow HTML argument. Markdown doesn't accept JavaScript though, but your JavaScript code can break out of a Streamit iframe to browse and hijack a very specific Streamit widget. I have like two or three videos about sabotaging the structure of your Streamit app and I'm sure you will love them. Now, how about moving widgets around? Streamlit has layout methods to position elements. You, you can, for example, include widgets in an accordion with ST expander. You can reorder the appearance of elements with ST empty placeholders or use ST columns to sort widgets in a horizontal layout. But you won't get the more advanced CSS layouts like, like grid layout or flexbox align items or, or justified text. So sometimes you do get those misaligned layouts. Labels. If you're a pixel peeper, you have no control of padding and margins between elements. Technically, you can add a blank sized column and new lines to make space between elements, but if you want horizontal margin to be specifically 62.7 pixels because I don't know your Figma designer said so, well, Streamlit won't help you much. And while you can create your own HTML blocks through unsafe markdown HTML, the STHTML method, or even integrate any JavaScript, React, Vue.js, Velt libraries through the Streamlit components framework, any of those will be strictly imprisoned inside its iframe. So no model window, no notification pop-up, no right sidebar, no loading backdrop, etc. At least Dash, Solara, or Reflex provide you with boundless freedom over how you design your HTML CSS structure in your app. In short, you're stuck with the elegant, modern, refined Streamlit look, where any CSS styling, any JavaScript moving, any HTML building you force into the app feels like... <laughs> Someone in the world thinks Streamlit has a very Y2K aesthetic, those are the years where we were building those kick-ass 16 bar drum machine beats. But if you're tagging yourself an instrument using player, 
writing down beats on a 16 bar grid feels way too rigid. I want to groove outside the 16 bar loop. And that's how I make sense of Streamlit. It's a Python looping machine that reruns the script every time you interact with a widget. It is very easy to use until you want to break out of that loop. Even the documentation tells you features to work around the linear top to bottom model are considered advanced features of Streamlit. You will find solutions like session state to store user interactions as Python variables that don't disappear after a rerun, on change and on click callbacks from Streamlit widget that patch session state with new values before rerunning the full script, the ST cache decorator to prevent an expensive function from rerunning if its argument didn't change, forms that prevent the rerun of an app for widgets inside it until you click on the submit button. Even the session state topic in Streamit has a lot of magic in it. You're a wizard. You can associate widget value to a session state key using the key argument. So when you interact with a widget, session state is updated automatically with the new value. But it doesn't go the other way around. You can't reinitialize the widget value by changing the session state key. Instead, you'll have to completely erase the widget by changing the key to a new one. This makes reloading widget state from a database a little peculiar. Those ways of breaking out of the matrix look great, but they don't interact well with other Pythonic ways of breaking out of the loop, like multi-threads or multi-processing or async queue. For example, if you want external threads to call streaming widgets, you'll need to register the threads with the add report context method, which by the way is an undocumented private method we're not really supposed to use, but hey, this video is about using Streamit outside of what it was designed for, so... What Kafka polling method or OpenAI streaming response would expose you its running background threads so you can pass it into add report context, mixing it with Streamlit's own event loop and... and I've done that for some real-time applications. You're basically running concurrent event loops without really controlling how they interact with each other. Streaming apps are vulnerable to scope creep when you put too much features into this single rerun sequence. Here's how a typical Streaming freelance project goes. Your Streaming app starts as a small content-focused MVP you show to your stakeholders. They get so impressed, they tell you to put it into production and then add a new slider, a logging form, an about page, Google authentication, pay subscription, post to social media, export as PDF, add a chatbot. Each of those add a new nested dependency inside the top to bottom loop and it just becomes a mess. Build your streaming apps the Unix way. Focus on demonstrating a single but highly valuable idea. At least that's my philosophy for using Streamlit. If you know your app is going to grow bigger and bigger, both in scope and size, or maybe you just want callback, I'd switch out from Streamlit to Panel for more complex and approachable apps or H2O Wave for real-time dashboards. Maybe all of this is going to change very soon because we're seeing some partial rerun commits, which sound very loop breaking. So stay tuned by subscribing to my channel. We've gone a long way for hosting LLMs on our machine, as solutions like LM Studio or Olama can expose a local LLM behind a REST API. There have been times where I wanted to configure a ML model from a Streamit app and declare a new web route from the backend server to serve predictions from it. Or maybe presenting static assets like AI-generated images or custom map tiles from the Streamit server. At this time, you can enable static file serving from a folder by adding the enable static serving equals true configuration. And any files in the static folders are now served by the app static file name URL. Though so you're limited to image file types, sorry, no video, nor folders with an index.html to serve as a static block. But hey, we are not backend developers. We have no reason to access and derail Streamit's backend server, right? If you dare not follow my previous advice and try to keep growing your streaming app for money, money, money. you will eventually want to play around the tornado backend server for, for backend stuff. And there's a lot of backend stuff you'll want to add. Plugging in new URLs, integrating OAuth authentication, managing cookies, reacting to custom headers from the request, 
adding Google Analytics, backend subscription management, just to name a few. The community has figured hacks for each problem, just look into the github issues for code snippets that edit the installed server.py script yes you're totally smashing the streamlit installation now other solutions involve adding a reverse proxy like nginx in front of your streamlit apps because you have control over this nginx and then you can use that nginx to add authentication or cookies or custom headers but it's uh, yet another component to configure for websocket passing and sticky sessions and https certificates uh, plus you'll probably need to spin up some docker compose to debug it locally <laughs> i'm sorry if you came into this video as a data scientist thinking i thought streamlit would transform me into a full stack engineer without having to be one why are you showing me so much front end and back end stuff <laughs> My point is, you'll want to play with the Tornado server behind Streamlit, but it doesn't let you access it. Just like, you know, libraries won't let you access its background threads, encapsulation rule don't let it see your, your heart. Streamlit being acquired by Snowflake means it's probably reworking the backend fronted connection to swap between multiple backends. If you had a PR for native Google Analytics, for example, this solution must work locally on Streamit Cloud, Hugging Face Spaces, Snowflake, possibly WebAssembly solutions like ST Lite. That is a lot of deployment platforms to take to keep to care about. How do other libraries work around it? Radio, shiny, nice guy let you mount an app as a sub app of a standalone FastAPI app. I think you can configure the parent FastAPI behavior through plugins like authentication, cookies management, and custom headers. And you get the side effects from those plugins on the Gradio, shiny, nice guy, etc. sub app. So you basically have the full FastAPI ecosystem working on your smaller app. In any case, any backend service you want to add to Streamlit would be better off as a complementary Nginx in front of the app. Streamlit is primarily designed as a front-end for your Python script. You can inject backend features, but I'd rather not break any more Streamlit. <laughs> Since backend engineering is outside my comfort zone, I decided to learn Google Cloud Platform and pass it professional architect certification. A and I discovered something very random. Do you know what's the common point between healthcare providers, government, public sector, and financial services? I'll let you five seconds to guess. 10 seconds later. They all appear on a specific Google Cloud Platform page. The compliance page. Those industries have some of the harshest data security and privacy laws and sharing your delightful yet sensitive streaming data apps over the internet or even on an internal air gap server with no internet connection is absolutely out of the question. So yes, there are a few cases where you want to send an app to your marketing colleague that doesn't rely on messing up a computer with WSL2 and Docker. Something like a native desktop or mobile streaming app. And there are other advantages to building a desktop or mobile version from working offline to accessing the device hardware like camera or notifications. Plus imagine the monetization opportunities if you could push a streaming app into the App Store or the Play Store. To be fair, you know, it's hard to call this a pain point. Trying to build an executable out of a web app, it's a little like Here is your very powerful interactive BI tool to visualize multidimensional data, lots of chart types, AI driven, user friendly, easy to share, super expensive. Sounds great. Can I download the data and explore it with Excel? Wait, what? Th there is work around building executables out of a Python app with libraries like PyInstaller, PyOxidizer, or CX Freeze. They have very detailed tutorials about how to correctly package all Python dependencies. Way too long and way too detailed for me to do a video about it. I'll be honest, I have no clue how to explain any of those solutions to myself, so I won't even try for this channel. But for Neil, everybody has a web browser. How about we get rid of the Tornado server? We don't have access to it anyway. And run Streamlit entirely in the browser. What? 
And so I'm very, very excited to announce a project called PyScript. Some developers are bringing Python to run entirely in the browser using the power of WebAssembly with initiatives like Pyodide or PyScript. Yuichiro, one of the Streamlit ambassadors, has built the STLite library, which runs Streamlit inside a Pyodide runtime entirely in the browser. You can try it out in the STLite sandbox without having to install anything in your computer. Put your Streamlit script inside an HTML file under a STLite tag. Send that HTML file to your colleague and let it be enjoyed. But with some effort, you can embed a Streamit app inside a full React project. And then you know what web library can build cross-platform desktop apps out of a fully bundled web app? Electron, the library to build cross-platform desktop apps from web apps, which enables the terrifying yet one of the easiest ways to convert a Streamlit app to an executable. Streamlit to STLite to Electron Builder to Electron Executable desktop apps. That has limitations. Don't expect to send an entire local LLM with the HTML file and have it work on the MacBook Pro of a colleague if there's none of the LLM C, C++ dependencies that have been built with Pyodide on macOS. And we haven't even talked about deployment on mobile and smartphones for the Gen Z that are stuck on their mobile. And personally, I have no clue how to build a native mobile app for my web app. There's probably a framework for this, but I, I have, you know, I've never tried, so I wouldn't know. Just rely on Streamlit being mobile responsive. If a smartphone accesses the URL for your deployed app, it adapts its horizontal layout to fit the phone screen. Honestly, if you really cannot deploy a Streamit app on a local server or a Docker Swarm Kubernetes cluster and building a distributable application like this is your top priority, uh, maybe you should go for a dedicated technology. There is a Python framework similar to Streamit but that relies on Flutter, a Google open source UI library that cross builds into desktop and mobile apps. It's called Flat. I haven't dug into it but I've been recommended flat in my comments a few times already. Uh, may maybe, you know, let's stop using Streamit for things that are way out of what it was meant to be used for, you know? If you browse through the Streamit landing page, you'll find this section. Streamit is compatible with basically everything. Your Python script can manipulate Pandas, Seaborn, Plotly, Hugging Face, OpenAI. It doesn't really matter. Well, what if there was a whole Python ecosystem not usable in Streamlit, but are in Shiny or Panel? <laughs> The Plotly library is one of my favorite libraries for interactive plotting. With a single Plotly Express call, I can generate a stacked bar chart from a pandas column then, and then display it with ST Plotly chart widget. Then I can interact with it, hover over data points to see the tooltip, zoom in or scrolling and hide charts by clicking on the legend. So the next step for a data analyst is can I select some of the data points to filter for a drill down analysis? The Plotly documentation does have an interaction documentation to react to click and hover events. It uses a component called Plotly widget. That, that sounds like what I need. Plotly widget is a Jupyter widget. They are interactive controls initially designed to run under Jupyter notebooks. And just like Streamlit, you have Jupyter widgets for Basically everything, sliders, checkboxes, accordions, maps, they're displayed inside notebooks and synchronize the state back into Python code. Similarly to Streamit components, there is a plugin system to integrate any JavaScript library into a Jupyter widget. And you know, Jupyter notebooks being the superstar Python coding interface for data specialists has grown a massive number of external widgets like IP leaflets or Py3.js or Plotly widget. While Streamlit has Streamlit Plotly events and an official Streamlit component that links Plotly.js back into the Python figure, Plotly widget is the official interactive widget for Jupyter, and it is able to react to any Plotly event to edit the figure without you touching any actual JavaScript. So can't we just embed Plotly figure widget into a Streamlit app? Nah, this video is already too long for an explanation. Do you want to do the explanation? Let me do it for you. Go read this article. It explains how integrating Jupyter widgets into Streamlit would work. TLDR. 
need to build a streamlit component whose front end spawns a widget manager, which communicates with a new object with custom com logic linked back to the streamlit rerun from top to bottom event loop. Thank you, Mr. Automatom. <laughs> All in all, we cannot integrate IP widgets in streaming apps yet, contrary to Voila. It's supposedly doable, there was tentative work on the forum, but someone needs to take on the reins. That's a big bummer, because it seems each JavaScript library now needs to bring a Jupyter widget and a streamit component, and a gradual component, and uh, any data app component. Not a lot of library will do this. And streamit components are usually maintained by one person only, who sometimes don't have the bandwidth nor the motivation to update it. Inflexible layout and styling, hidden event loop and backend server, missing on Jupyter widgets. With all of those flaws, streamit keeps growing at a fast pace and is still widely popular today. Now, don't get me wrong, you can build very expressive and advanced interactivity within streamlit, but I feel Streamlit falls upon the content side. It's designed for you to create interactive data science content without spending mental energy on flashy design. Well, I will bring my worst comparison ever. Streamlit is to data science what WordPress is to web developers. Both are excellent choices for quick user-friendly websites that focus on the value of the content, and then you can add your custom JavaScript code to extend the library. For example, here's how to create a component for your own own interactive plotly figure in Streamlit, you will learn just enough JavaScript to have the hidden power to extend any other data app library you want. And for the others, I'll see you around. Bye!